two husbands with unfaithful wives? Sound familiar? Good evening and welcome to day 29 of the 100 Days of Shakespeare event. My name is Paul Adams from Small Crown Productions and uh, welcome. Welcome if you're here for the first time. Welcome back if you are here not for the first time. Uh, Very excited to be here. We are day 29 29 of the 100 Days of Shakespeare. Um, If you aren't familiar with what that is, uh, there is a link in the description below that will take you to a Facebook group. It's got a little bit of information there. Or you can pop over to the video that will pop up here and it will take you to the first video I did in this series of 100 videos, uh, which will tell you a little bit more about the project. Um, Tonight we are looking at a synopsis of Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humour. Ben Jonson, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, uh, spoke about him in this video here, if you want to check that out. Um, it's a little bit around his life. There is actually a whole lot more to uh, to dig into around Ben Jonson's life. Um, things I didn't touch on in that video were that he, you know, won a duel, killed a guy, um, was arrested for it, and because he could speak Latin, claimed... Uh, privilege of the clergy, and uh, essentially got let off. Um, But tonight, what we're going to do is have a quick look at a synopsis of his play, Every Man in His Humour. This was the first breakout play that he had, uh, written around 1598, 1599, it was on the stage. And um, this harkens back to some of the classic tropes of English theatre, the old man being cuckolded by his wife, um... It plays into some of the stereotypes of the humours. I mean, the whole concept of this play is that um, some of the characters represent fairly pure forms of the humours. So uh, if you don't know what the humours are, I'll pop another link up here to another video uh, which will tell you about the humours and what they are. And I think it would be a really great piece of information to have when you are reading through not just this play, but Shakespeare's plays, understanding that Elizabethan world picture and the way that the Elizabethans kind of saw the world as a whole. Um, So without further ado, let us get into this play. And I think there are some aspects of it, if you know Shakespeare's work, that will probably ring, ring, kind of have some resemblance to them. And I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly at the end. So this is a five act play in classic Elizabethan style. Um, it's not strictly iambic uh, in its form, um, but it is filled with lots of poetry, uh, lots of verse. Um, there is a prologue at the start of this that is written from Johnson's own point of view, saying that essentially what he wants to do is make a comment on the deeds and language of London and show a selection of its people, um, and essentially how silly some of them are, uh, and, and that some of these people are representations of the humours. So in Act 1, we meet old man Noel. You could say Noel, but it's K-N-O-W-E-L-L. So Noel or Noel, um, who reads a letter sent to his son Edward Noel and is unhappy at its contents because it's an invitation from a London gallant um, uh, well-bred who is bidding Edward to come down to the old Jewry, which is the Jewish ghetto where you know all the Jews lived in this in this street and it was you know obviously a bit of a financial hub as well. And uh, basically come down to the jury and, and get up to some mischief with him for them to just sort of paint the town red a bit. Um, old man Noel wants his son to grow up to, you know, to grow into a responsible man. But he knows that if he pushes too hard, he will just rebel and go the other direction even harder. So he decides to you know, let him go, but he's going to follow him and keep an eye on him. Now, their servant, Brainworm, decides that he's going to disguise himself and follow old Newell and report back to Edward what the old man is doing so that he can keep tabs on him. Now, uh, now, meanwhile, somewhere in town, meanwhile, somewhere in town, uh, we find Matthew, who is a... Um, uh, is it po- potate? 
potator, potester, potester, uh, basically someone who who is a very bad poet and steals other people's poetry. And so he's quoting passages throughout the play from Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, which is obviously a very famous play at this point um, and very, very well known. It was probably the most played play in this era. So it's a really, really well known play. So people would have recognized the text that that was from. So he's out there quoting Thomas Kidd's Spanish tragedy, trying to pass it off as his own work in the play. Now, he complains to Downright that um, the half brother of Wellbred, um, sorry, let me rephrase that. He complains to Downright, who is the half brother of Wellbred. So you've got Wellbred, who's invited Edward down. And his half-brother, Wellbred's half-brother, is Downright. So Matthew complains to Downright um, that uh, he was accosted a little bit. And so Downright um, uh, teaches him some sword fighting techniques just in case a bit later. Now, once we're in London, we meet Kitely. Kitely is a London fabric merchant. And uh, he's a slightly older man. And he complains to Downright that his half-brother, Wellbred, so Downright has come to Kitely's house, and he's complaining that Wellbred, Downright's half-brother, who has been living in Kitely's house, is keeping bad company and just wreaking havoc and, and causing a lot of problems. At that point, Cobb, who is a local water delivery guy, delivers some water, and uh, he's... He's coming back a bit later, so it's just worth noting that he's there. Um, Kitely, in classic trope, believes that his wife is having an affair. And uh, at that point, he's so frustrated, but he heads out to complete a transaction somewhere else. Now, we end up back at Kitely's house where Edward, Wellbred, and a few of their entourage have arrived. Matthew is trying to woo Kitely's sister, Bridget with some plagiarized poetry, um, but Edward is a bit keen on her. Now, Downright is fed up with all of them because Kitely's had a go at him and he's now angry, so he has a go at all of them and in a fit of rage basically tells them to leave, which they do. Kitely arrives back home believing that his wife is uh, having an affair and basically believes he's in the house and starts searching out the house, trying to find a lover that is not in the house. Sound like another play you know? Maybe. Hang around, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you know what it is, pop it in the comments. Now, meanwhile, Cobb, the water delivery guy, for some reason, believes that his wife is having an affair. And so he tells her to stay inside while he has to go out and do some work. Now, Brainworm, Edward's servant, He's still disguised. He arrives and tells Kitely that the justice has called for him. So Kitely leaves and he's gone for a while. Um, but as he leaves, he says he's going to go and get Cobb because he needs a witness. And his wife is just confused about why Kitely is constantly looking for Cobb. Why is he always looking for Cobb? And so Brainworm tells him, well, Cobb's wife runs a brothel and your husband is a frequent customer. So she's obviously now going to get a little bit upset. Now, Dame Kitely, so Kitely's wife, grabs one of the young guys, Thomas, and heads to Cobb's wife to sort this out, leaving uh, a chance for Wellbred to start encouraging Bridget to like Edward and to marry Edward. Now, Kitely and Dame Kitely, so Kitely and his wife, arrive at Cobb's house separately but at the same time, expecting to find the other one in fits of passion and adultery, uh, obviously which none of them are. But when they explain why they're there, Cobb hears that his wife is running a brothel and so is angry with her and, you know, he beats her, basically, for bad behaviour. Uh, now, they all head down to the justice to find a solution for this. When they get to the justice... The justice pretty quickly sorts out that they've all been duped. And at that point, Brainworm and the entourage uh, turn up. 
Brainworm outs himself and says, yep, look, it was me. I caused all the havoc um, and it was a bit of a mess. But um, you know what? Edward and Bridget are getting married. And so he, he lays that out on everybody. And then just after that, Edward and Bridget arrive and they're met with congratulations. And the justice mentions that this is a day that would be remembered for a long time to come. So there you go, really quick overview. Obviously, there is a lot I have kept out. I've stripped out the main storyline and and taken out a lot of the other subplots and a lot of the other kind of sideline comedic moments that are just little laugh-a-minute laugh a moments that you will find through some of the, the scenes. It's, it's a five-act play, so you know I was just trying to keep you to the main storyline so we could get through that. But two husbands both alike in dignity, two husbands who fear that their wives are having an affair. Do you know a Shakespeare play? <laughs> Sounds very much to me like a main plot of The Merry Wives of Windsor. So Shakespeare was um, very well known to uh, Ben Jonson. He actually performed in one of Ben Jonson's plays in 1616. You know, these guys were borrowing ideas and and snaffling ideas from each other all the time so it would not be unsurprising for Shakespeare to take that idea and develop it further into the Merry Wives of Windsor and uh, not uncommon at all so um, the other thing that I want to point out in this is that you know this is still around um, you know late 1590s that this play was written and this idea of the justice mentioning that this day would be remembered for a long time to come. Kind of puts this play into the context of a single day. Everything that happens, happens in a single day. Now, that is not uncommon in the classics of the Greek writing. So, in classic Greek plays, everything that happens, happens in one location. So, one town. So, you might have, you know, the perspective of the early theatre backdrops, um, giving you a sense that this is one location. So it's one town, but it's one town you can see. You're looking down the main street and you've got, you know, a set of houses on one side, set of houses on the other. This location is where this whole play takes place. And he's marking that in this play as well. So it's a bit of a throwback to the, to the mindset. And, and it is through this period that we start to see theatre break out from those classic styles of one day, one location, one time, and start to become way more elaborate. And we know that particularly in Shakespeare's work where we're jumping from country to country and land to land and, you know, land to sea and doing all of these things that, you know, really up until a period of time not too long before this, that kind of um, journey for the audience of asking them to believe all of this was unheard of. So um, that is something to really mark about this period of theatre, that this is really where some of the imagination of writing took hold in these in these periods. And so, you know, that kind of harkens us over to, oh, what a muse of fire, the opening to Henry V. Um, so a bit of an idea there just to kind of touch on. But there you go. There's the synopsis of Ben Jonson's um, Every Man in His Humour kind of some classic tropes in there, the old men being cuckolded, they're all being fooled, you know, classic kind of uh, English theatre there, and, and you see a lot of that happening. So uh, there you go. Thanks so much. Uh, it would be great if you gave this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and uh, have a look up here if you missed the video talking about Thomas Kidd, uh, sorry, Ben Johnson and his life. I'll pop that video up here, and uh, I will also pop the video here to the next one, which will be about um, Ben Jonson's other most sort of famous play, which is... Um... <coughs> that one. <laughs> it's very late here. I'm very tired. Holy cow, what's the play? Ben Jonson. Oh, my Lord. Oh, whatever it is. It's that one down there. I can't believe it. I've just had a complete mind blank. Anyway, thanks for being here. I'll see you on the next one. Ciao. It is gone from my head. Oh, the alchemist. Idiot, of course, the alchemist. <laughs>